all of these. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I see that's about, it's 401. So we're just going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to today's uh, Tips Lunch and Learn program hosted by the Tips Law Practice and Legal Department Management Task Force, which Denise Demasco and I co-chair. Uh, today's program is co-sponsored by the Tips Reintegration and Practice Renewal Task Force, the Women Trial Lawyers Committee, uh, the Committee on Outreach to Young Lawyers, in the solo and small firm task force. Uh, if you'd like to learn about these task forces or any other task forces and committees of TIPS, uh, TIPS members can find us on the ABA Communities site. And if you're not yet a TIPS member, what are you waiting for? I'm sure you'll want to join us after you meet, uh, meet our speakers who reflect the incredible breadth and experience of our members. Uh, today we'll be discussing remote trial work and learning from, from five stellar speakers. If you have any questions during the webinar, um, as you all know, uh, please put them in the chat box and then we will get to them and uh, as best as we can. And then of course, please remember to mute yourself if you're not speaking. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to Rich Williamson, who will be moderating today's discussion. Thank you, Debbie. Um, yeah, my name is Rich Williamson. I'm a lawyer with Robertson, Johnson, Miller and Williamson in Reno, Nevada. Um, thanks everyone for, uh, for joining us today. I think it's gonna be a really good program and a great um, kind of second piece to, uh, to the program we put on in March um, about just sort of remote working. Um, obviously COVID is not quite behind us, um, but hopefully it's, it's receding. Um, but as we move forward, I think remote trial work is here to stay, and we put together a wonderful panel uh, to discuss um, how to do that effectively and, um, and what to look for in your practice uh, going forward. So I'd like to uh, introduce our panel. Um, first, we've got Robert Barton, who's a shareholder with Bullivant Hauser Bailey in uh, Portland, Oregon. Bob's primary pre practice focuses on motor vehicle transportation defense including commercial trucks and school transit buses. Uh, Bob is Northwest Regional Counsel for First Group America, the parent company for First Student Inc. and First Transit Inc. Uh, we had um, uh, Aaron Cicerella, who's a uh, solution specialist for Thomson Reuters. And I do wanna give a shout out to Aaron because she was so uh, integral in putting this panel together. Unfortunately, she couldn't ultimately join us because she was hauled into jury duty. So there's a, a bit of a ironic twist. And uh, so Aaron cannot join us uh, today. Uh, next, we've got Tiffany Collins, who's the managing partner and lead trial counsel at Collins Legal Group, LLC, a Baltimore-based litigation firm. Uh, Tiffany has litigated, litigated cases at all levels in state court and in many, many federal circuits uh, throughout the country. We also have Kevin Flaherty. Uh, he is the U.S. Managing Partner of MDD Forensic Accountants. Uh, Kevin is regularly retained as an expert in the areas of commercial and individual economic damages, shareholder matters, and business valuations. And finally, uh, Tamara Tomomitsu is a partner at Borden Leidner Gervais in Toronto, where she practices in the disputes group and is chair of the firm's Diversity and Inclusion Council. In her practice, she defends municipalities, insurers and insureds in complex property and casualty insurance claims, disability claims, and errors and omissions claims. Um, Tamara has appeared at all levels of court in Ontario and before various administrative tribunals. She's the immediate past chair of the TIPS Women's Trial Lawyers Committee. So I want to thank the entire panel for, uh, for joining us. We really have a great esteemed panel uh, and uh, I'll get right into the program. First, as I mentioned, we put on a uh, program in March on remote, just general remote working uh, and the future of remote working in, uh, in law firms and law practice. And so I'd like to kind of pick up where we left off and first discuss uh, preparation challenges and how to properly prepare for trial um, when, when members of your team, maybe um, critical paralegals and staff members or other attorneys, uh, witnesses and, and uh, experts are 
um, are remote. So I think, Bob, you recently uh, just finished up a trial. And I know Lauren talked about in our last program um, that your firm does have sort of a hybrid work environment. So how did that trial go? And do you have any tips on how to properly work with team members who are working remotely? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Uh, and thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, I just finished a month long trial in King County, Washington, which is Seattle uh, Superior Court. Uh, it was a high dollar value case where the plaintiff was seeking $40 million in damages for a Microsoft employee who sustained an alleged uh, traumatic brain injury. And I won't get into the weeds on, on it, but this was my first experience with a Zoom remote trial, which uh, there's such a backlog of criminal cases in the docket up there in Seattle that the judges have all adopted the Zoom format. And even though there have been constitutional challenges, uh, one of which I filed to the right of confrontation, cross-examination, because it's obviously a lot different when you're in the Zoom context, uh, they're uniformly denying those motions. And given the backlog of several thousand criminal cases, I don't see any end in sight. Uh, even going into the next year or so. Um, a couple things on the preparation side, and I know other panelists want to talk about this as well. Um, I, I was kind of surprised, and the, the judge even told us this, it's not your typical trial where you're used to roaming around the courtroom, you know, addressing witnesses, looking at the jurors in a box. Uh, it's a whole different format, and it's very foreign to most of us because it's more like TV than it is like court. And for that reason, there were a number of things we did on the preparation side that we normally wouldn't do. Uh, we had engaged basically a, a television production company, if you can believe it, to assist us in uh, lighting, uh, in backgrounds, because uh, we were remote. We were in our Portland office while the trial was up in Seattle. The other attorneys were in their offices. All the witnesses were remote. And most troubling, perhaps, all the jurors were remote. They were all in their homes, if you can believe this. Some on futons, dozing off as witnesses were testifying, et cetera. Uh, so it was quite a challenging environment. So the first thing we did was engage a television production company. They assisted us with making sure that we had adequate lighting, adequate uh, microphone, audio, because uh, you don't want to be talking into a conference room with an echo. Uh, we arranged a background that looked more like a, a courtroom or a law office behind me. Uh, we arranged for backgrounds and um, assistance with uh, our witnesses so that they weren't in a dark environment. We had to basically work on lighting and all these other things that you wouldn't normally think about. Um, and uh, among the minor things, but it was kind of interesting, is we actually, uh, myself and another lawyer who was involved, had to do makeup uh, because otherwise uh, we came across as looking too pallid in the environment that we were in. So. Uh, I skipped the mascara, but I did the rest. Um, uh, but uh, in all seriousness, it's a whole different ball game when you're preparing for a Zoom trial. You also have to make sure that uh, you've got 12 basically jurors, but then we had four alternates because this was a month long trial and they're all in little boxes, just like we're all looking at different boxes with each one of us on there. There's no way that you can watch each juror and measure their reactions yourself so we had basically a couple of paralegal trainees in addition to uh, my paralegal and a couple other lawyers watching the jurors to test reactions, to, to observe any changes that we could perceive. And that way we could perhaps modify our examination of witnesses, et cetera. So there are a lot of different aspects to it that are quite challenging. I'm not a, necessarily an advocate for it, but it's kind of the brave new world, at least in that part of the country. And so, um, Happy to entertain any questions that any of you might have about kind of the nuts and bolts of that, that type of environment. Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you. I think we're going to want to come back to a lot of that because um, I think that's going to be really helpful for the group. But before we move on, I wanted to bring in a couple of our other uh, panelists. Um, Tiffany, you, you're a litigator. Have you had any trouble preparing for any remote trials or um, remote hearings? when maybe team members are absent or other folks are, are working remotely? 
So we, uh, since, since our practice started back in 2013, we have specialized or kind of made a regular part of our practice using cloud-based software. I think one of the most important things that you have to have when you do have team members working remotely, especially when it comes to trial prep is everybody needs to have access to the documents and you need to have immediate access to the documents so that you can see if edits have been made and everyone is using the same version of the document. So, you know, we use our cloud-based um, file management system. We have a cloud based um, client case management system as well. And then we definitely made use of things like Teams and Zoom and WebEx to have kind of like our uh, firm meetings. And then in terms of getting ready for the actual trial and trying the cases, one of the most important things for us were indexes to make sure that everyone had a, or a running list of the documents. We use indexes in trial anyway, but usually, you know, you're writing in the boxes yourself, which exhibits are being admitted, which ones are not being admitted, what's been identified. Um, but for, from a remote hearing standpoint, it was a little more complicated because you couldn't always see the other party's documents. And then once the document leaves the screen, you know, you don't know, you, you don't have it to refer to it unless it's been sent to you in advance. So we just used a lot of, um, kind of like organizational documents to keep track of the evidence that was being admitted, to keep track of any of the um, evidence that was being either presented or identified by the other side, and also to keep track of our own exhibits as well, which at the end of trial, you can always turn over those lists to the jury and they're appreciative of it because it helps them kind of keep track of where the documents are and what documents came in. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Um, Tamara, how about you? Uh, so for us, we've pretty much been paperless as a firm for a few years. So um, accessing documents isn't as much of an issue when we're all remote because they're all scanned into the system and everybody uh, can access through them through our document management software. Uh, we use Teams, we use WebEx um, uh, for meetings. And then, you know, sometimes you just have to be in the office. So we, we try and, and keep our distance. We'd use a big boardroom, keep our distance, wear our masks. Um, in Ontario, the courts, uh, use case lines. So shout out to Thompson Reuters, <laughs> uh, who can be, Aaron can be with us today, but that makes actually management during trial or pre-trial uh, much easier because everybody uploads all their documents ahead of time. So you can actually see the other party's briefs and all their documents. And then the court registrar marks the documents as exhibits. So you don't have to go through that. And the registrar keeps his or her own uh, index of that for use of, of counsel at the end of the day. So case lines actually streamlined everything for us and makes it a lot easier. So, uh, you know, we had to do a little tutorial uh, ahead of time, but we have uh, excellent clerks. <laughs> and that's one thing that I think uh, we realized when you, you move to a, a paperless and virtual system is you rely very heavily on your clerks and um, you need to have good ones in place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kevin, you know, obviously we're going to we're going to get to sort of witness preparation and things in a minute, but just generally speaking, both with your firm and also it, um, in terms of preparing for a specific um, you know, specific clients or specific uh, retentions you have, has it been a challenge collaborating with other members of the team remotely? And if so, kind of how have you overcome those challenges? Yeah, I, I don't think it's changed too much for, for us as experts as far as preparing and preparation and meeting with counsel. Uh, most of that was usually done over the phone anyways. Um, Obviously, as a firm, we're relying on Teams and Zoom and, and all of that. And initially, it was a document issue, right? Who has the document, the right document, systems crashing, that type of thing. But uh, most most of the impact to us is going to is in testifying a different skill set now by video and sure. some nuances and depositions. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well then let's we're we're going to come back to that in a minute. But before we move on. I actually wanted to follow up um, with something that both Tiffany, uh, you know, really actually Tiffany, Bob and Tamara all hit. And that is um, working with exhibits and sort of document management for remote trials. Um, so um, I guess Tamara, I'm gonna come back to you first. 
on that case lines, and you're you're almost going to have to be somewhat of a surrogate since I know this was partly what what Aaron was going to talk about. Um, but the um, I guess could you can you walk through how that process works, both with opposing opposing counsel, but also with the court clerks, and just making sure that evidence is um, submitted on that platform and, and kind of uh, um, appropriately marked. Well, I think it helped probably about. I'd say eight months ago, there was a scathing decision from a judge that said, all counsel better get to know case lines and better know how to use case lines because I have no patience for this. Because what, what happened at the beginning, you know, everything's new and with new technology, you have to work out the kinks. And so sometimes counsel would be uploading their briefs two, three, four times. Um, they'd be amending briefs and then uploading a full amended brief as opposed to just the additional documents that they wanted to use. And so there was a little bit of a trial and error period there. But the nice thing about case lines is you can see all the plaintiff's documents, you can see all your documents, and all you have to do is click on the document and it opens it up. So it's, it's really been beneficial for us. And I think we were a little bit worried moving into virtual hearings and, and, and trials that you know, it was going to be cumbersome, but it's been really quite easy. And even those of us who are maybe a little technologically impaired um, have been, you know, have, have acclimated quite easily to it. Uh, we all had um, case lines training beforehand. And it is, it's, it's really easy. I thought it would be much more difficult than it actually was. Um, and the court registrars are all up to date on it. They went through case lines training. So it really is, you know, just a matter of identifying the document, making sure that it, you know, you, you um, mentioned to the court, you want it marked as an exhibit and then the court registrar just does that for you. So it's a really great system. Yeah, okay. All right, now, and now Tiffany, you were mentioning the indexes that are sort of so important, um, but that some of the difficulties you encountered if say someone just screen shared a, an exhibit and then it went away. Is there any particular platform that you have found is helpful or not helpful or a, a good method for coordinating with opposing counsel and coordinating with the court on marking uh, exhibits in advance? So our state, so our state court is a little bit uh, behind in federal court. So in federal court, um, prior to trial, we have to submit evidence lists anyway. Um, and so you kind of get used to that with opposing counsel. So one of the things that we've done at the state court level to try to, it's very similar to what we do in federal court, but we make sure that all of the documents are bait stamped, one. And then when you are referring to a document, you're not only referring to the title of the document and its exhibit marking, you're also referring to its Bates number as well. Um, and so when things are being introduced onto the record, even down to like our clerks, when they're recording them, they're recording the exhibit hyphen, whatever the Bates number is. Um, and so the, you know, they're exchanged in advance so that everyone can review them and make sure that you have the documents, that the corresponding Bates number that's on the exhibit list also matches the Bates number that you have on the document as well. Thank you. That, no, that's, that's helpful. And so just a little more, I guess, forethought in terms of making sure you're adequately preparing the record um, and that everyone's clear on what the documents are since you all can't necessarily huddle over a, an exhibit binder. Absolutely. And it makes it easier to keep track of the documents as they're coming in. Um, you know, with some of the complex civil litigation cases, you're, you're easily dealing with 50, 60, sometimes 70 exhibits. And a lot of them sometimes are communication, you know, so it's June 15th email, June 16th email, June 17th email. So, you know, one of the things that we learned early on was that the way you label things is so incredibly important. Um, and then, you know, you marshal it kind of like the same way you would for trial where you know which exhibits are coming in with which witnesses but the indexes just really allow you, and even for the purposes of creating or crafting your closing arguments, it really allows you to direct the judge and the jury exactly where you're going and which document they need to look at um, so that there's not, oh, hey, can you put that back up on the screen again? Wait, you know, can I see it again? Um, can we show this again? Everybody is kind of following the same rubric that identifies the documents. Got it, okay. Um, Bob, how about you? How was your experience in at least kind of lodging exhibits ahead of time and coordinating with uh, the other parties? Well, it's very similar to what Tamara and, and Tiffany have just talked about. In Washington State Court, where I tried that case, uh, we have to have uh, basically exhibit lists, witness lists, pre-marked exhibits. 
what we ran into, and this is, I'm sure, universal, is when there was need to redact information that should not be in the exhibit, whether it's a social security number or some other information, and, and if it wasn't caught in time before the exhibit was marked, and then that exhibit had to be resubmitted, the court, at least in our venue, had to require us to submit a whole new exhibit, not try to amend the existing one because it wreaked havoc with the uh, staff to upload amended uh, versions. And that, that segues into another topic. Uh, my paralegal, Darty Robinson, to whom I'll give a shout out, who's been doing this a long time, was so integral in making sure that we got through all these logistical issues. And what she did, which I think all of us know to do, is establish a rapport with the court staff. I mean, they're your friends. They're the people you have to work with. And when they realize that you're trying to make their job easier, they'll try to reciprocate and make our jobs easier. And so we were able to kind of remedy a lot of glitches, if you will, by coordinating with staff. Usually after hours, we'd be sending them emails. What about this? What about that? And that made all the difference in the world to try to make things go a little more smoothly. Got it. Okay. Um, and now I want to I want to pivot a little bit. And so, Kevin, I'm going to turn back to you as an expert witness. Um, how has remote trial work changed how you both you prepare for your testimony and how your uh, you know the the lawyers you're working with prepare you and you know meet and maybe go through your testimony in advance? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think Bob mentioned it. it, it it's more like a TV show. Um, more aware that you're as I sit here now I feel like I'm speaking to myself where, where I'm in a courtroom I have that eye contact I can be more of that teacher and get that feedback and see visual cues and and you don't really get that in this type of environment so it's a lot more work um, to to try to connect with the jury for sure um, or the arbitrator even anybody <laughs> And how um, in so, you know, I know like I would prefer when I'm when I'm preparing a witness, I would always prefer to have the witness come in, be in my conference room, you know, sort of go through, go through their direct a little bit, maybe moot some some cross. Um, has that been a challenge? Are you still basically able to do that remotely? Or I guess how, how has that process worked for you? You're still doing it remotely. You're doing it by Zoom. It, it's successful. It works. It, it's just more tedious. It, it's yeah. more exhausting. It seems like, you know, what you might do two hours of, on a Zoom feels like six hours in person. Um, so it, yeah. the, pace, the pacing is different. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Tiffany, uh, any, any kind of particular, I guess, experiences or tips you can provide on uh, when witnesses are remote and making sure they're, they're getting ready? Absolutely. Um, so we, you know, typically with witnesses, we would do our, our prep um, in person. We try to, you know, have as much in-person contact as possible. So what we incorporated into our prep was we started doing prep via Zoom or, or um, whatever the medium was the court was going to use. Uh, some of our courts use Zoom for government, some of them use WebEx. Um, so we would prep them with that particular um, for, with that particular platform, and then we would kind of walk them through the features. We uh, would supply um, iPads for any witnesses who didn't have um, a separate camera device because, you know, some people only had their phones, depending upon the case types, they only have their phones. So we would make sure that we would provide them with a, you know, with a firm loaner for an iPad that would already be set up with all the information that they needed. Um, we similarly would make sure that they had a kind of neutral background um, and just talk to them about different positions in their home. That would be the best place to take the depositions. I'm sorry, not the depositions, the best places well, for depositions as well, but um, for them to give their testimony and the iPads were great because it allowed them to move around to different areas of their home so that we could see what they would look like to the jury in that particular place. Because, you know, one of the things that Bob touched on that you don't think about is lighting was actually a really, really big deal. And the last thing you wanted was, you know, the jury squinting to see the witness or you know that the witness not being in the um, the picture frame, you know, properly, you know, in the middle, centered in, in the middle, or just you could only see from their chin down, or you know, the chair that they were sitting in, or the background. So it really gave us an opportunity to see what the jury was going to see, you know, first. Um, and we felt that that was very helpful in doing it that way. And you know, interestingly enough. 
you know, getting the iPads to the clients and getting them back was fairly easy. Oh, good. Okay. You didn't have too many walk out the door and not come back. We, we didn't have any. We didn't good, have yeah. everybody. Everybody returned them. Um, but, you know, you just always worry with uh, witnesses who were out of state, whether, you know, shipping them and making sure they were able to get them back. And people are becoming more and more tech savvy, uh, which is wonderful. I mean, they at least know how to turn the devices on. They know how to you know, make sure that they're powered up. But that was very helpful for us. Um, the, the, the phones were a big deal, right? Which was some people, that's their primary means of communication. And I think we learned the hard way during a deposition that you absolutely don't want to witness testifying from their cell phone. Like the cell phone rings and the screen goes blank and or they get a text message. It just, it was, um, it was a lot. So that was one of the things that we did that I found extremely helpful. Okay. Rich, I, I would add to that a, a little bit that when you go into a courtroom as an expert or any, any witness, right, you walk into a courtroom, there's that, that air of seriousness as soon as you walk in, right? You, you're going to be properly dressed. You're going to be polite. And what I've seen on these Zoom and WebExes, I think people have let their guards down and they forget that they're sitting in their basement or they're sitting in their back porch. And uh, a lot of informality has, has kind of crept in and they kind of forget the environment they're in. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And I think that's a good point because it, where it's easy for them to let their guard down, I think that probably grates. I know it grates on judges and my guess yeah. is it probably grates on jurors quite a bit too, or at least some, you know? So yeah, it's a whole other a whole other variable you got to try to control for a little bit. Um, to, tomorrow, how about you? Um, any, uh, I guess, any challenges or uh, or success stories in terms of preparing witnesses and making sure they're they're in a good position to testify so just to um, uh, um, hit on something that Kevin just mentioned the first discovery so in Canada we call them discoveries in the US their depositions that I did via zoom the um, plaintiff was in a bathrobe laying down on her bed. So, uh, you know, you just, you never know. You're worried the bathrobe, you know, is, is tight enough and I'm not saying things I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to be saying. So I think Kevin's exactly right. When you walk into a courtroom, there is an area, air of seriousness. You sit up a little bit straighter, you pay a little bit more attention. And when you're at home, you know, you really have to minimize distra distractions, but you also have to be prepared to give evidence. And and Tiffany mentioned the phone. Uh, I also, one of my my first, my, I think it was my third um, discovery that I did, the person was on a phone, the screen was cracked. So I think these little um, things that you do ahead of time to make sure that your witnesses present as well as possible at trial are really, really important. The other thing that we noticed is that sometimes when people are using laptops, they put them on their tables and then they're looking down and it's an odd um, kind of effect. So to the extent that we could, we, you know, we'd ask them to, and we test it, right? put it on a book, put it on something higher so that you're on level ground. So you're looking up and you're not looking down, um, making eye contact. And I think we all had a, a little bit of difficulty with that when we first all went virtual. Where do I look? Do I look at this person? Do I look at this person? Do I look at the camera? Where do I look? So I think all those little things that you have to take the time, we never took the time before because we didn't have to worry about it before, but you're going to have to take the time and work it into your prep sessions to make sure that your witnesses have the best possibility to come across as well as possible during, during a trial. Yeah, and, and so then Bob, I guess that's a good segue to you. You mentioned a little bit at the beginning about all the efforts, you know, the video production, not just for yourself, but your witnesses I guess how much you know, planning ahead, did that require and, and were the witnesses receptive to it? Well, uh, quite a bit of planning ahead of time. Uh, and, you know, to pick up on the last point that Tamara made, uh, where to look, uh, you know, I had to be trained to look at the camera and not look at the screen. And we had to train our witnesses to do the same thing. And we enlisted the assistance of a trial consultant to help the witnesses. You know, uh, people like Kevin, who are sophisticated, experienced experts, it's not so much an issue, but with lay witnesses, and a lot of my clients are bus drivers, and, and so they're not used to even being in the setting of a courtroom, uh, much less a Zoom uh, court. Uh, we had our trial consultant assist them with how to, how to dress, make sure they're not wearing something that says Budweiser across the front, uh, and uh, where to look, how to present themselves, the angle of the cameras, et cetera. Uh, these are all little 
uh, integral parts that we normally wouldn't think about in a courtroom setting, because as Kevin mentioned, when you walk into a courtroom, there's a certain magistry and, and certain decorum that it just automatically falls to you when you walk in that you know this is a formal setting. Not the same when you're in a Zoom setting. And in fact, it kind of translated on the jury side where we have had jurors basically on futons, uh, you know, listening to the trials and and you wonder how much attention you're really getting. The judge is supposedly monitoring them, but you know there's 14 faces or more on the screen. Uh, so these are all logistical challenges that I've never encountered before. And that's why you need as much assistance through the trial, but ahead of time, you need assistance, prepping your witnesses, making sure they're up to the task so they make the best presentation possible. We had one of our uh, witnesses who was a bus driver in this case I tried, who actually had moved from Seattle to Wisconsin to a remote part of it. And so we actually flew our uh, uh, TV production people out to meet with this witness, take him to a hotel where there was a conference room where it had much better lighting, much better uh, setting than they could monitor and assist him with the visual and the audio side because I'm sure it would have been a real disaster if he had had his uh, Zoom testimony taken from his, uh, his trailer parked in a remote area of, of a lake. Yeah, well, and, and that's actually a, a perfect, uh, I think a perfect lead in to the next question I wanted to ask about is, so sort of despite best efforts, uh, I think sometimes technological problems still happen, right? You know, internet connections are not always great. Someone's computer may die. Uh, who, who knows? Yeah, someone gets called on the phone they're on or the iPad or something. So I guess how, um, you know, what what have you all encountered and what are some ways to mitigate against those things to the best you can, knowing some sometimes stuff's going to happen, right? So yeah, I'll, I'll kind of open it up to the group. I'll quickly tell a quick story. I, I, yeah, I, just, I just saw it just saw it this morning. It was in the middle of a deposition. And uh, there was there was a belief that the witness had had notes and, and was being coached. Um, this was videoed, of course. It was on Zoom or WebEx or something. But at some point, the witness banged her camera and it fell onto the desktop and all the notes and all of that <laughs> that, she, that she had been reading were all laid out and displayed displayed wow. to everybody. Yeah. It was a coincidence that she banged the she had with her iPad, but uh, ultimately it, it all got disclosed. Yeah, well, and that, and that kind of highlights two issues, right? I mean, you're, you're sort of going to, there's two issues there, right? She had, a, it sounds like thankfully for, uh, for, for truth and justice, she had an equipment malfunction. Yeah. Um, but there is that, I, I know, I, it, particularly in, um, in remote depositions, I've been very concerned and have asked people, right? Are, are you reading notes? Is, are you messaging with someone? I see you, it appears that you're typing. You know, I've tried to draw that out, but you really, right? Whereas you, uh, you know, I think we've all heard the stories of, you know, someone, someone's looking at their phone in a live deposition and you'd stick an ex exhibit sticker. On. I would never do that, but certainly, uh, that's uh, something that can happen. Whereas you don't really have the ability to take control when the witness is, um, is remote. And so, um, you know, I think that that's the other side of the coin, right? Both controlling your witness, but also if you are the cross-examining lawyer or the, the noticing lawyer in the, in the deposition, how you, how you deal with a witness that may be being coached, maybe looking at documents that you would otherwise get to get in there. I've been asked to pick up my laptop and show my camera around. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and that's a good way to at least sort of establish establish the room. Uh, Bob, so how I, you? or, or tomorrow? Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say I actually did that to a witness because I was certain that somebody was in the room because I could hear clanking, and I asked them to pick up their laptop and give me a three hundred and sixty of the room. Good. No one was in there at the time. I'm sure they scurried out right, by the yeah, time right. the laptop so got the around. But yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So so I've done that. Yeah. Okay. Good. And the witness complied. It sounds like. Yes, and and counsel completely understood why I was asking. I said I hear yeah. clanging in the background. Like, what's going on? Yeah. Um, and I said I'd like to ensure that nobody is in the room with him. And so I, I said I'm going to ask that he give me a 360. And the, the counsel was fine about it. Good. Um, but I've done that. Yeah. Yeah. And and like <laughs> again from. From opposing counsel, right? I mean, as long as they're not in on it, I'm sure they'd be. I'd be mortified, right? If my if my client then was messing around or playing games, 
Um, so yeah, so it's nice that yeah. they were they were cooperative in that. Um, you know, Tiffany, Bob, how about you? I, I, you know, I've had some very interesting experiences with opposing counsel to the point that now if opposing counsel is present with the witness, let's say the deposition is being taken virtually and the, the deponent is in the same room as counsel, I request for them to both be on the screen, you know, together. I, as much as we all like to think that, you know, we can be deceptive in that way, you know, it's just, there's some things that are just so innate that are going to always be tells, which, you know, the eyes moving, the, the, the weird pauses, you know, the um, kind of elongated speech where you can tell that they're obviously getting information from somewhere else, whether it's a person or, you know, um, another person. I have had, um, you know, I, I had a case, uh, I think maybe earlier in the process when we were doing these remote cases where the, um, the witness, she was an adverse witness, but in the middle of her testimony, you know, brought her kids on the screen to say hello to the judge. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the judge was pissed. The judge was like, you know, your kids aren't exhibits. What are you doing? Yeah. You're, we're in the middle of a trial. But I mean, the, the you, kind of echoing what Kevin said, you, you see that when you're not in the courtroom, there's a general loss of decorum. And, and I don't just point the fingers at witnesses because I've seen it with, you know, opposing counsel as well, doing things that you clearly would not be doing if you were present in a courtroom, you know, with a judge right there and a jury right there. Yeah, yeah. Just an ancillary point, and I, I think that's really interesting because I always wonder if the, the, the lawyer's kicking the client under the table and you can't see it anyway, but, uh, um, but I, in this trial I had, interesting enough, the jurors uh, commented during uh, jury selection the plaintiff's attorney broached the idea, well, would any of you be disturbed if, you know, we're going to be asking for several million dollars? And the plaintiff was on a screen where the jurors could see or the prospective jurors could. And one of them said, well, she looks fine. What, you know, it's kind of like, well, you're asking for that much money and she's walking and talking, smiling. But at, during the trial, the plaintiff really wasn't on screen a lot of the time. And see, in a regular trial, we're used to having the plaintiff sitting at counsel table. And we all know that even when the plaintiff's not on the stand, the jurors are looking over there and stealing glances. And, you know, is she able to walk, talk, you know, move? Uh, what, what's her mannerism? What's her demeanor? And you lose that, at least I did in the Zoom trial, because she was able to only appear at discrete moments because she's on a small screen. And, 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 you know, if I had it to do over again, I think I would insist that she be uh, available 100% of the time. But, you know, you're thinking about everything else. You've got the witness on the screen, the judge on the screen, the lawyers, the, the jurors. But that's something I think we all should be mindful of, that you should insist that the parties be visible on screen throughout the trial. Now, it cuts both ways. Obviously, that means your client has to be on the screen and you have to tell your client not to make faces if, if he or she hears testimony they don't like. But I think it, it's worth it because more often than not, I found over the years that jurors do kind of scrutinize the plaintiff in particular because they're kind of looking at this person, how, how you know, credible are you, how believable are you, how injured are you, or how damaged are you, et cetera. And you don't have as much scrutiny if they aren't even on the screen 90% of the time. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's a good point. And I don't, if there's any trial consultants in our audience, I'd be curious if there's been any... Uh, um, you know, any, any mock trials um, or any focus groups analyzing whether it's a favorable or unfavorable thing when someone, someone kind of, um, you know, takes off their video, um, does it create kind of an empty chair issue or, or, or is it, is it a great way to maybe neutralize what otherwise might be an unsympathetic uh, party and, you know, keep them, keep them shuttered as, as long as, uh, uh, as long as possible. Um, and, you know, just one one comment I know we just received in the chat is that, um, you know, to protect against coaching, um, as, as I think, you know, Kevin and Tamara, you both discussed is sort of uh, maybe reaching stipulations ahead of time about presence of people in the rooms, um, negotiating who uh, who's who's visible and who's not at which time that that kind of thing. And so that would really again talking about preparation. Um, I think a lot of this goes to, um, you know, sort of courtroom courtroom guidelines and courtroom procedures, um, 
that you don't often think about ahead of time. At least it were, our, we're traditionally part of our checklist, right? Of things you needed to coordinate ahead of time. Um, it, it's it's a, uh, I, I think we need to start building these things into our kind of preparation checklist a little bit. Even at, uh, at, at deposition level, I've run into numerous technological glitches, whether it be yeah. a, a storm, power outage tech, but but data or, or document is is really a hassle. I'll tell you in a deposition. Um, if you well, that's perfect. Yeah, Kevin, that's actually because that's where I wanted to go next. Is yeah. you know we talked about kind of marking exhibits, but both in deposition and in trial, uh, I, you know I think we've all seen successful uses of screen share or different things, and we've all seen very clunky ones. So yeah, yeah. no, please please share. Yeah. So, so as an expert, right, I, I would much prefer if, I, if you could produce the documents, even if it's an hour or a half hour before the deposition, right? If you know what you're gonna produce it, let me download it so that I have it on my computer, okay? Um, because what's happened is you get into the deposition, you get into a screen share and you might be asking me questions. You're, you're showing me a snippet of, of the document. I don't even get the whole document, right? It, and I gotta say, well, no, I'm trained to review the whole document, think about it. So now I have to tell you, could you please scroll up a little? Could you please scroll down a little? Okay, let me, okay, now I'll go back to your question, okay? So, and then often what you'll see is they'll share the document at the same time, but it takes a long time to share a big document for everybody to get it. And you're just waiting for that spinning wheel. So if you can get the document to the expert a little bit before I have a protocol in place to say, download them. Now they're on my computer. You can put up your screenshot as you're talking about it. I can look at the full document uh, as if we were sitting in the same room. It goes, it goes a lot easier. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a really good point. Both, um, number one, like you said, it's clunky to have to require someone to scroll up and scroll down for you. But the other thing is, whereas I know I always uh, encourage my witnesses, right? If you're handed a document, um, you make sure you read front to back before you answer a question. And if if just one page is shown on the screen, you can see there is an inclination. It, it's, uh, I guess it, it's, there. there's more friction in terms of asking someone to share the whole document with you. Whereas if you've got a binder in front of you, you can flip through all the pages on your own. You don't really need cooperation. Um, from the other side. So that, you don't that, need them on paper, to, right? Just share yeah. them electronically with, with yeah. the, so that they have, they can put them on a second computer and look at the whole document, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So both. And so to me, that goes to two things is, um, you know, planning ahead of time and preparing your witness in case that doesn't go the way it should. And then also reaching some sort of trial protocol with opposing counsel in the court as to how these things should, should proceed. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, Tiffany, any, uh, any issues in terms of, um, you know, we talked a little bit about, um, about marking exhibits and you mentioned that, I guess, any other, um, pros and cons or, or good best practices for dealing with, uh, with exhibits? Well, one of the issues that we continually ran into was, um, sometimes in cases we do a lot of personal injury work and you need to mark the exhibits. You need the witness to physically edit the exhibit to put X is where he was and the square is where the defendant was. Um, and so, you know, I don't know that we've found a clear solution to that problem, um, especially when you get into like full-blown trials that has been become problematic. So we've been trying to kind of work with the, for trial purposes, we've tried to work with the expert or the plaintiff, whoever the witness is, to kind of create um, like a series of exhibits that we would attach as exhibits, you know, A1 through 10. And um, it's almost like, it reminds me of like, you know, like a cartoon book, you know, where each page has like a new marking on it. And I mean, it doesn't move or anything, it's not cool, but it just kind of simulates where they would be putting their markings. Now in depositions, it's a little bit easier because you can, Zoom will allow you to um, give control of the meeting to the witness and they can use, you know, their mouse to mark things on exhibits. But then the issue became, how do you memorialize those markings, um, which usually turns into some type of screenshot. And then you have an exhibit that has the markings on it, but it also, you know, on the right corner has the everybody's 
little window with their face in it where, you know, they've been working, where they've been watching the process. So I think that has proven to be the most difficult part. We haven't really found a, um, a, a global solution to that. Um, in trial, definitely more difficult than in depositions. Yeah, and that's a good point, you know, more and, um, you know, I know in, in live trials, we like to sort of like use a smart board and, and as much as possible have our witnesses be able to interact with that right on there. And sometimes then those can print out, but I, you know, maybe there's some sort of a, a technological platform, but I'm not as familiar with one that you could use in the remote, in the remote setting as, as seamlessly as you otherwise would. And yeah, I would think Kevin, Right, as an expert witness, you want to try to, we'll get to connecting with the jury in a minute, but it's that same kind of idea that sometimes it helps to, to be able to educate folks and um, step, come maybe come down from the witness stand and, and do a bit of a presentation. And that is just a little more difficult when everything is, uh, is digital. Yep. Um, I, I actually have some questions I want to ask you, but first I want um, Bob and um, Tamara, did either of you have any uh, uh, any thoughts in terms of best practices on sharing evidence or sharing exhibits that we haven't already touched on? Uh, I think we've talked about it. I, I, I think the idea of sharing them, we, we basically reached an agreement with opposing counsel in my trial that we would not only uh, forecast at least 24 hours in advance which witnesses were going to be called, but we would overnight, you know, at the end of each trial day before the next day, we would send each side um, our respective exhibits that we plan to use for those witnesses. And that that obviously addressed some of the concerns Kevin raised about, you know, our experts getting confronted with a document at the last minute while he or she's on the stand, so to speak. Uh, so that was one way. And the judge was fully on board. We asked for that when our we had our pretrial conference that we make those arrangements so that there were less uh, surprises. And of course, the judges hate it when there are these glitches and delays because of, you know, uploading documents at the last minute or exchanging documents at the last minute. So that worked for the most part pretty well. And I think uh, that's something I, I think probably is done universally in, in trials or should be. Yeah. The, you know, one, um, I, I, I practice primarily commercial cases and real estate cases. And so mostly I'm, I'm looking at boring documents and emails, um, but for those of you that have more exciting kind of tort-based practices, I'm curious, has anyone had any, um, any occasion to try to use any physical real evidence um, in the course of a remote trial? I don't know, you know, a, a, a bumper from a, a collision or so, something, something tactile that then, again, doesn't always lend itself to a, to a screen share. I'm not sure if anyone's even encountered that yet. So, I have not. Okay, brave, brave new world. So that's it. It's like, you know, so hopefully, uh, uh, so again, at least something to think about and plan for ahead of time. If you've got any uh, unusual evidence that, that can't easily be reproduced on, uh, on a computer screen, I think you probably want to take, take extra special care ahead of time to make sure you can, um, you can present that. The opposing party gets a fair chance to examine it. Uh, and of course, the trier of fact gets to gets to look through it. Um, so um, we we've touched on them a little bit, but uh, um, I, I I like to go about how to connect with with juries or with the finder of fact. Um, the um, you know I think one of you mentioned the difficulty of eye contact. I know I same thing. I try to look at my uh, you know look at the video screen, but I think all of us you have a tendency to look at. Uh, maybe, you know, who's speaking or maybe yourself or maybe an email that just came in. And so how have you tried to overcome the challenges of connecting with whoever your finder of fact is when you don't even really, sometimes it's hard to tell if they're even looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> it's easier. It's easier with a finder of fact than a jury for sure. Yeah. Yeah, a lot easier. <laughs> what one set of eyeballs is easier to, to track than yeah, yeah, 12 or 13. Yeah. And a jury, it, it for me, it's awfully hard because as, as you're teaching, you can see the person who's drifting or straying and you can kind of lock them in with your eye contact and bring them back. Yeah. Uh, him or her back. But it, it, it's hard in this environment. Um, fortunately, the more complex ones I've had are still in person. Right. So it's been 
smaller ones that uh, had to deal with it. I cannot imagine doing a complex case with the complex damages and trying to present it to a jury by Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 oh, yeah, please, tomorrow. Sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I'm, I'm with Kevin in the sense of Ben's trial, I, I can, you know, that's it, one thing. Um, jury trials via Zoom, uh, you know, Bob, you've got my sympathy. I don't, I don't blame you for challenging the, uh, yeah. the confrontation uh, issue because I, I that, that just gives me a lot more, a lot more concern. But yeah, tomorrow, please. I tend to move around a lot. And I think you can probably see I talk with my hands um, quite a bit. And so I found it um, when we were doing practice run throughs, this did not translate well. <laughs> so it, it's really hard when you're used to being, you know, a you, you move around, you, you, your hands are moving. It's really hard to keep your hands down to yeah. not be a distraction to what you're actually saying because you're in this small box and they're only seeing part of you. Um, so I found that difficult. And the other thing I also found difficult with a judge alone is sometimes they're looking down and I don't know what they're looking at. I don't know if they're writing. I don't know if they're looking at a case that I'm referring to. And I tend to speak quickly. And so I slowed down my pace dramatically because I just wasn't sure what was happening to the point at one point the, the judge actually looked at me and said, okay, counsel. And I'm like, okay, all right, <laughs> all right, I'll keep going. But pacing was really hard. Like I find pacing really difficult over this, a, a virtual platform. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I can. I think that's a that's a really good point, right? Sometimes you're if you're in the middle of either looking at exhibit or a, or a PowerPoint presentation or something. I know I've kind of paused on a slide when you can tell the judge is maybe diligently taking notes of, of what's ever on the slide, and so you don't want to advance it till they're done. But uh, you you don't always know whether they're focused on it or not, or they might just be checking a text message and couldn't care less what you're saying. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, th I think the point that uh, Tamara raises is, is really an excellent one and it points out the real one of the real downsides of Zoom trials is because as litigators, we're used to communicating verbally but non-verbally. And, and even picking up a document and approaching a witness, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? And you know that has a certain aura to it. The jury focuses, oh, there's something important. This lawyer's walking up and giving this exhibit to the witness and they're going to be paying more attention. In the Zoom trial, you're not doing that. And, and you know, there's a certain... I don't know, uh, monotony, if you want, uh, to doing it the way we're doing it. We can't use our hands to gesture. If we do it as a negative impact, we can't be very uh, uh, dramatic because sometimes drama comes across uh, artificially in the Zoom setting. Uh, so it's really a very challenging kind of uh, format, I think, for all of us. And I go back to, uh, I had to train myself in this trial to look at the little dot at the top where the camera is versus trying to look around at the jurors because I'm they're looking at me looking at something else, right? I, I'm used to thinking I'm looking at them, but I'm not if I'm not looking at the camera. And so it's a whole different uh, kind of um, artifice. Uh, and and I, I hope it doesn't go on forever. I think judges, at least in that venue, love it because they can process a lot of cases a lot quicker. Uh, but I, I really think it has a lot of uh, negative aspects to it. And I do think we lose a lot, uh, you know, by having this kind of artificial remote setting. I, I just don't think, as we've already talked about, people are as focused. Uh, I don't think we get as much attention. And I think there's a certain informality that undermines the whole idea that this, these are important matters that need your full attention. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tiffany, how about you? Um, so, you know, in thinking about like the difficulties, uh, one of the difficulties that we've run into is impeachments. Like it's very difficult to um, impeach with prior testimony, like trying to get a transcript to someone who's not with their attorney at the time. And you, you know, you don't want to, you can't put it on the screen because you don't want the whole thing to be read. And that has proved to be difficult and, and almost impossible to some degrees. Um, the interesting thing that I would say the for me, one of the, you know, bigger downsides is that 
when you're looking at a screen, so my screen in my office where I'm where I am now is like a, like a huge like 27 inch Mac screen, and so you know if I um, maximize my Zoom meeting, I can see everyone's face very very clear, right? Um, and it's large. And the problem that I ran into, or the concern that I have is that I can see the judges' facial expressions so much clearer in Zoom than I can see, or, or that I would probably even notice in court. You know, when we're in court, a lot of the arguments we're making, we're making them to the jury, you know, other than in motions hearings, but most of them we're making them to the jury. And when a witness is testifying, a witness usually isn't even looking at the judge, they're looking at counsel or they're, you know, looking at the jury. And, um, you know, it's been raised in our local bar that judges kind of gently raised, of course, that judges need to be a little <laughs> more cognizant of their facial expressions because the witnesses and the jurors are looking at them more so in this context than they would be, you know, in an actual courtroom. Um, and I, and I, find, I found that to be more distracting than the judge looking down or, you know, or whatever. Yeah. That, that's that's a really good point. Yeah, you it almost is better uh, what what you don't know, right? Is that sometimes it's better if you're a little in the dark and and if it's if if those not if those kind of facial expressions are coming through too clearly, it can sort of throw you off and maybe affect the other people. Um, well, we, I've got I've got one more question, but I wanted to, uh, but we've only actually got about three minutes left. So if anyone in our audience has any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, and while those are coming in. Just one other question. We've talked about a few. Um, the, the video production, Bob, that you, you and Kevin really both talked about, and, and Tiffany, the idea of, of shipping iPads to um, uh, two parties, I think, is a, or two witnesses, I think is a great idea that I hadn't, I hadn't thought of. Um, any other sort of, I guess, technological ideas, platforms? Uh, you know, we don't, we don't want to pick sides in the uh, uh, in the WebEx, Zoom, uh, Microsoft Teams, Google fight for uh, fight for dominance, but uh, you know, any any particular platforms or software or things, um, technology that you found helpful in this process? I, I think in terms of the video conferencing, I haven't found one to be you know superior to another. I think they all you know kind of offer the same thing, and it's just a matter of figuring out where to click in each one you know the annotation option is in a different place in teams than it is in um, zoom and th that that is probably the most difficult part getting courts to just kind of decide which one they're going to use of course would be better um, you know webex is different from zoom in that if you use WebEx, you have to actually download the program. I think Zoom kind of will allow you to use it in like a web-based format. Um, and so people struggle with that in terms of getting on and being available and ready at the time that their cases are being called, especially like in district court cases where there's a, so our district court is like our lower level court where there's no jury trial. So their dockets are bigger and they're moving a larger amount, a, a larger number of cases. And what happens is, you know, someone's hearing is at nine o'clock and they can't figure out how to connect their audio. And we're sitting there waiting for them to connect their audio or for them to, you know, figure out how to turn the camera on or even figure out to, how to log in, you know? Um, and so I, if I had a complaint, that would be my bigger complaint. And I think that that stretches across all of the platforms. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bob, Kevin, Tamara, any final thoughts? Can't think of anything. Okay, well, that's okay. That's actually perfect. It, I mean, just just like we wrote it up, team. That was perfect. It is now uh, uh, one fifty nine uh, Pacific, which means. Really, those of you on the East Coast, I'm impressed if you hung around this long. <laughs> and so I just want to uh, to thank uh, thank our panel, and uh, I'll turn it over to Denise. Thanks, Rich. What a fantastic panel and breadth of information you got. And I think we can all agree that the virtual world is not perfect, and it is not just us being stuck in our ways. Um, so I do want to thank Rich for you putting together this panel of tomorrow. Uh, Kevin, Robert, and Tiffany, great information from everybody. 
I do want to thank, uh, on behalf of Debbie, you and myself, also thank the TIP staff and our co-sponsoring committees, the Law Practice Management Task Force, Reintegration and Practice Renewal Task Force, Outreach to Young Lawyers, Solo and Small Firms, and the Women Trial Lawyers. Uh, we do encourage you to go to the TIPS YouTube channel and watch our previous Lunch and Learns, including the one put on by Rich on a similar topic a few months ago. So this was part two of working in a remote world. And again, thanks to the TIPS staff and wishing everybody a good weekend. And please visit the TIPS page if you're not a member. Check us out. You'll have some fun. Thank you all. Thank you. Nice weekend, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Take care.